Folks, this is Book Talk with Corbin, and I'm your host, and we have with us today another great guest, Daniel Greenfield. We're going to be talking about his booklet, Disloyal, How the Military Brass is Destroying Our Country. Pretty disturbing title. That's one reason why I wanted him on. I know our listeners, I got a lot of uh, military folk in my personal background, but also amongst my listeners. Let me quickly uh, introduce my guest before we go into it. He's a conservative uh, columnist, investigative journalist. He is uh, with the Shillman Journalism Fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Hey, folks, we've had uh, David Horowitz on a couple of times. My most loyal listeners know we've had him on a couple of times. You can go to the website, www.booktalkwithcorbin.com, and search and find uh, at least two or three interviews we've had with David Horowitz. Anytime he speaks, you should be listening. Um, now, our guest, he is, uh, he's done some, his, co- his op-eds have appeared in the Jerusalem uh, Post, Newsweek. He has a blog, personal blog called Sultan Kanish. Very prolific writer, fantastic journalist. He writes on all sorts of stuff, folks. Everything from terrorism attacks in Europe and Israel to uh, he touches upon uh, issues with the NFL Mm -hmm. to leftist politics in America. And again, his late we're here to discuss his latest uh, booklets, about 40 pages, uh, Disloyal, How the Military Brass is Destroying or not destroying, but betraying our country. Sir, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a really important issue. You better believe it's an important issue, and it's it's a disturbing one. I'm hoping that you'll say to me that maybe you you exaggerated a little bit with that title. Are you able to say that to me? Or are you saying something else? A few weeks ago, uh, this would have been a really tough discussion. Right now, we're looking at Afghanistan. We're seeing this really bizarre spectacle where the Secretary of Defense, where the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs is saying we can't go out and get Americans. Uh, We've got thousands of people just holding the inside of the airport. Uh, It's been announced that the Taliban have put the Haqqani network, which is basically Al-Qaeda, it's an interface between, kind of a fusion between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in charge of security in Kabul. Uh, The head of the guy who's now in charge of security in Kabul has a $5 million reward on his head from us. Uh, the British are going out there getting the people. The French are going out there getting the people. They're bragging about it. Uh, we're not going out and getting our people. What is going on here is the question that so many people are asking, so many Americans are asking, what has happened to our military readership? I mean, we are seeing this right now. It's not just a theoretical thing that I wrote in the book. It's not just an anecdote that some people are reporting. You can turn on cable news and see it happening live right now. Happening right before our faces. Now, it, you say right here, Exactly how is, from your standpoint, the military brass betraying our country? Is it, is it has something to do with this whole woke mentality, critical race theory? What are you saying? That's definitely part of it. I mean, we've seen variations of this happening under Democrat presidents, under the Clinton administration. It was all about getting women into the military. Under the Obama administration, it was all about using the military for environmental causes. Now it's all about critical race theory. The upshot is you basically have Uh, Democrats who are turning the military into their political platform. They're not focusing on war fighting. They're not focusing on success. And you've got brass who are very happy to play politicians or happy to give them what they want because they don't have to deliver real results on the ground. I mean, if you're spending all your time with whatever the current political cause is, you're virtue signaling about it, um, you're holding conferences about it, you don't have to deliver real world measurable results. You can just live in this fantasy world in which you're focused on the bumper stickers, you're not focused on the mission, and we're seeing the results again right now. Right now, as far as our ability to, as you as you put it, other countries are saying, no, we're we're going out and getting our folk out. Whereas the United States is saying, well, can't really do that. (laughs) Yeah, it seems like we can't really do very much anymore. And that's the tragedy here. Part of your salute, do you see sort of see a, a, a solution or what, what needs to be done? Is some of these policies need to be reversed and we just need to focus on the military 
getting the military prepared to do what it's supposed to be doing? No, I think one of the bigger pictures here, bigger picture issues here is cultural. Um, one of the things the previous administration, the Trump administration tried to do was decentralize this huge presence in Washington, DC. And that's a really big issue for the military. The top military brass are based out of DC. They're based out of this entire huge government, what I call an imperial city. They're focused on being politicians. They're focused on appealing to uh, senators. They're focused on dealing with the White House staff. Uh, the, really this kind of politicization of the military I mean, we think about it, yes, there's the wokeness factor, but there's also the general situation where some of the top military brass are operating like politicians. They're focused on politics. They're not focused on the mission. They are very far away from actually dealing with the real world situations and the real world crises. Frankly, we need to get the Pentagon out of Washington, D.C. We need to get a lot of the government out of Washington, D.C., uh, but the Pentagon is especially crucial because you've built this entire monster here uh, where the defense industry is intertwined with the uh, heads of the military, we're intertwined with the various politicians and their aides, and all of this is really just one giant swamp. And the people who come out of it, who succeed in it, who get to the very top, are not the people we need to actually win wars. They're the people who are good at politics, who are good at lobbying. They're going to wait until they can get as high as they can. They're going to retire. They're going to go into the defense industry. They're going to sit on the boards of corporations, and they're going to perpetuate this swamp of corruption. Uh, we need a fundamental change at the culture at the top, and you know, we've really got to get this mess out of D.C. because D.C. is where everything breaks down. Mm -hmm. And we in, in getting them out of D.C. and getting them focused on, as you put it, defending the nation and winning wars. Right now, their home base is D.C. They're completely insulated, not only from what's going on overseas, they're insulated from what's going on with so many parts of America. Uh, D.C. is very much its own echo chamber, at least the parts of D.C. that are a government city. Um, they're not actually, they're focused on what does the Washington Post want for me? Um, what does this particular senator want for me? What does this White House aide want for me? Um, they're completely detached from what's going on on the ground. You've got American soldiers right now. Babies are being handed to them up through razor wire. The guys in DC really are not having to deal with anything like this. They don't understand what the situation is like on the ground. And it's been this way long before this. The mission in Afghanistan went so badly uh, because there was a complete detachment from the talking points that people in DC embraced uh, whether it was we're going to win the hearts and minds, we're going to um, set up a government. And the reality is all the things they were doing, none of it was actually real. None of it was actually happening. Uh, but they were stuck on the talking points. They were stuck on pushing the political agendas that people in D.C. wanted them to push. They were not telling politicians what they needed to hear. They were not actually expressing the hard facts. And we're paying the price for that. Sir, where can we get this booklet? How can we get it disloyal? How can we get it? It is available through the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Our site is frontpagemag.com. Uh, it's right there on the sidebar. Um, or you can uh, type in relabel.ly, disloyal. Either way, you can read it. You can get downloaded as a PDF. If you want a physical copy, um, we're selling them pretty inexpensively for like 250 or so. Um, and I think this is a really an important conversation that needs to happen. And you know, as bad as the situation in Afghanistan is, if we're up against China, we're up against even tougher foes and we're not ready, it's gonna be a much tougher conversation. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I wanna just veer off a little bit, veer off the subject a little bit. I assume that you're pretty familiar with the Israeli military. Uh, I think I'm more familiar with the American military. I grew up in the United States, but I'm somewhat familiar with the Israeli military. Reason why I ask is because I have never been more impressed with the nation's military than Israel's. I mean, I, I just recently watched a documentary on, you know, how they went into Uganda and rescued those hostages there. I mean, it was just absolutely, it was amazing. What is it about the U.S., about the Israeli military that they're just so effective in, in doing things that I would almost identify as miraculous? You know, there are a number of factors. One of those is that everyone serves or at least is supposed to serve. It's like the way the United States military was uh, before we turn into a volunteer army, which unfortunately sometimes draws from people who feel like they don't have other options. Um, the Israeli military reflects the larger Israeli society. Just about everybody is going through the military in one form or another. Um, it creates a bond and it creates a sense of we're all in this together. And that's, you know, the other thing. Uh, Israel has very little breathing room. Uh, in the United States, you can 
I mean, you can look at what's going on in Afghanistan and then you wonder to what extent does it affect us? Israelis don't wonder that. It's a really small country. I mean, it's a country small enough that you can walk it. And when you're seeing things going on, you know exactly how it's going to affect you. Um, everything, uh, there's no sense of it's out there. We are separated by oceans from it. It's thousands of miles in that direction. No, it's right over there. It's a few miles away. It could very well come. Um, people are going into bomb shelters in major cities every time a war begins these days. So there's no sense of it out there. And there's no sense of it's somebody else. Somebody else's sons are out there fighting. It's our sons that are fighting. Everybody has skin in the game, always is supposed to have skin in the game. And it's, you're either served, your children are serving, and your sense, you understand that if something goes wrong there, uh, you're right there on the front line. So there's no vast gap between the civilians and the military. There's no vast gap between those are the people over there and we're the people over here. And that creates a great deal of investment. I mean, there are also quite a number of other elements. One of those is that officers absolutely lead the way. Um, you mentioned in Tebi, you had, I believe, the Air Force Chief of Staff actually in the air um, at the time, which is absolutely mind-boggling for any major military to do. But the, the Israeli philosophy, which goes back to its early days in the militias, because really the Israeli military was both out of militias not all that long ago, was the officers are supposed to take point, they're supposed to lead the way. And obviously, uh, Israeli officers suffer a high rate um, of casualties, a much higher rate than any other military, but at the same time, you don't have the situation where um, people are just being sent off into danger and uh, back home, nobody really understands what's going on. Um, and that was actually crucial to Israeli victories in some wars, for example, in the Six Day War, um, where on the Egyptian side, the um, officers would hang back and they'd send the soldiers forward. The Israeli side, the officers would lead the way. Mm. One last question about the Israeli uh, military, if that's okay. Um, the situation with Iran, I believe it's Iran that's building a nuclear plant. Now, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm, I, I, I'm a little disappointed that the United States hasn't just come out and said, if you build a nuclear reactor or whatever they're building is, is with nuclear stuff, we're going to take that as a direct threat to our, our great ally, Israel, and we're going to take it out. Now, am I missing something? Am I, am I missing I'm being very diplomatic or maybe am I exaggerating the, the danger? Uh, you know, Iran having nuclear capability would have to Israel? I mean, it's a danger to Israel. It's a danger to the United States for that matter. Iran has a lot of terrorist groups associated with it. Uh, it could hand over nuclear materials to some of those terrorists. And just on an economic level, once it actually has nuclear weapons, it's going to believe that we can't do anything to it. It's going to blockade shipments of oil, uh, which means energy prices are going to completely get out of control. I mean, they're pretty bad here. I'm in LA and I've seen six dollar gas. But, you know, if Iran actually has nuclear weapons, it's able to choke off the supply. It's able to monopolize it to such a degree. And we don't uh, boost production in this country. Uh, we're going to see a huge economic catastrophe here. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Folks, this is Book Talk with Corbin. I'm your host. Um, I have uh, this brother right here, Mr. Daniel Greenfield. He is a, um, a Shillman journalism fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Uh, we have done several interviews with uh, David Horowitz, a New York Times bestselling author, a couple of times. Go to the website, booktalkwithcorbin.com, and um, see some of the interviews uh, uh, we've done with David Horowitz. And I'm happy to say that we're Soon, probably in a couple of weeks, we're going to have uh, Mr. Daniel Greenfield's uh, interview posted there and posted in other places. And we're discussing his latest pamphlet, Disloyal, How the Military Brass is Destroying Our Country. Sir, just one more time, let us know, let my listeners know where they can pick that up. So they can go to frontpagemag.com or um, it's right there on the sidebar, or you can type in uh, relabel.ly. Um, backslash to soil, and that should take you directly to it. But either way, it's not it's not hard, at all hard to find. And you know, this is the beginning of what we're doing on this issue. We're continuing to stay engaged with it. And as more attention is brought to it, as more people are asking about what's going on, what happened in Afghanistan, uh, we're going to continue dealing with this because it's more relevant than ever before. Thank you so much, sir. I'm going to be in touch, and I really appreciate you.